Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard with a very special edition of the Watchman Video Broadcast. The question on everybody's mind is, where did I come from? How did we get here? How did life end up on this planet, which seems to be the most unique planet in the entire universe? How is it that we got here? How is it that life began? How is it that the universe began? You know, they trace everything back supposedly to what they call the Big Bang. They say that all the mass and all the, all the stars and everything that is in the universe was at one, at one time, one big giant clump, and that it exploded throughout space. They call it the Big Bang. But the question is, is even, even if that's true, how did all that stuff get here? The Bible has the answer. So we're going to discover that the Bible has the answer for how the world began, how the universe began, how life began. And there's one common element that unites all of God's creation together. Let's look in the scriptures. Colossians chapter 3 verse 11. The Bible says where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. And I want you to notice this part here. But Christ is all and in all. We're going to discover something here in a little bit that's going to show you that this verse means exactly what it says. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. For by him were all things created. It's speaking of Christ. By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. In other words, God created everything. I'm talking about the entire universe. He created everything that is for himself, for his pleasure. The book of Revelation chapter 4 says it this way, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, the Bible says that everything that is in the universe was created by God and for his pleasure. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly get a lot of pleasure out of the things that God has created. I like to, I, I like to go outdoors. I like to see things that, that God has built on this planet, trees and rivers and ocean. Every time I cross a bridge that goes over a river, I look at the river. I want to see the river. That is pleasing to us the way the layouts of rivers and lakes and streams and, and ocean waves. People go to the ocean. Why? To see the ocean, to experience the ocean. It gives us pleasure just like it does God. One of the things that I like the most is looking at stars. I love to go out on a clear night, especially in the wintertime when the air is clean and you look outside. We live out sort of in the country away from the city lights and you can see a lot of stars at night. And I love to look at stars. I love to look at pictures of galaxies. Here's one. I want you to notice uh, this is a very common picture that we see. It's a picture of a spiral galaxy. Most galaxies, let me, let me explain this. A galaxy, in case you don't know, is just a cluster of of a lot of stars, billions and billions and billions of stars. That's what a galaxy is. Most of these galaxies are clustered in this sort of spiral thing. We're going to see something about this here in a little bit. A few years ago, NASA sent up a space telescope called the Hubble Telescope. It had the ability, once it was in space, to see farther into space than anybody had ever seen before. Now, here's what I, I, here's what I like to do uh, when I'm speaking at conferences talking about this subject. What I'll do is I'll have everybody in the audience to take their fingers and put them together like this and to make about the smallest opening in their fingers that they possibly can and hold that up to the to the sky or to the ceiling. This picture here that Hubble took represents about that much space real estate. Okay, In this picture, this is called the Hubble Deep Field. They were looking, according to their observations, 14 billion light years into space. They were looking farther into space than anybody had ever seen. And here's what they saw. They didn't see, these are not just singular stars. These are galaxies, galaxy clusters with billions and billions of stars in each and every one of them. God, and that's just this much space real estate that we're looking at. So there are, pro, there are an innumerable amount of galaxies in the universe, and each galaxy has billions and billions, possibly trillions of stars in them. 
and God created every one of them. Now, here's an interesting thing about this particular picture. Um, you know, that everybody says, the scientists say, that the, the universe is 15 billion years old, and a big bang took place, and over time, all of these galaxies began to form. Here's the problem with that. This picture supposedly is looking 14 billion light years away from the Earth, and if that's the case, we shouldn't be seeing these galaxies perfectly formed the way they are right now. Something just doesn't add up. But I could just, I, I just love looking at these pictures and, and this, this fascinates me, this concept of the universe. In fact, let me, let me do this. You know what the word universe means, okay? Um, break it down. One verse. This is what we have in our Bibles, by the way. We have verses of scripture. That word actually, the word universe, literally means everything turning into one, or united as they turn into one. Take a look at this galaxy again. Everything is turning into one, and that is what the, the entire universe looks like. And all of this was created by the very mouth of God. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 5 says, For this they willingly are ignorant of. This is what most people in the world refuse to understand, refuse to believe, refuse to even think about. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. In other words, the Bible is specifically saying to us that God created the entire universe by speaking them, by saying, I want this done, I want this done. Genesis chapter 1. I want you to notice, Genesis chapter 1 is the story. I believe it's the true account of the creation of everything. And I want you to know, because we're just going to make sense in this teaching. We're just going to make sense in this, in this video. And I, and I hope you follow along with this. If you have doubts... Uh, concerning how the universe got here, where we came from, what is it that defines life, how is it that life shows up, what is the purpose of that life, what is the end of all life. We're going to try to answer that according to the scriptures in this teaching. And so back in Genesis, I have it actually written on my tie, in the beginning God created. See, that's what I believe. I believe Genesis chapter 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This is the foundation of my life, my belief, my religion, and everything is that, that I believe that God created. By the way, our founding fathers in America, they actually wrote it into the Declaration of Independence that, that we are endowed by our Creator certain inalienable rights. You see, our founding fathers believed that there was a Creator and that the Creator is the origin of the blessings of man and the rights of man. And so that's what I believe. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything that is. And I want you to notice how God created everything. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Notice verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and for years. And so the Bible is just, if you just read Genesis chapter 1, you'll see clearly the Bible saying, and God said, and God said, let us, and God said, do this, and God said. And so everything in the universe, according to the book of Genesis, was created by God simply speaking things into ex existence, and here they are today. And so what we're, what we're going to see in this teaching, we're going to see the connection that everything that is, everything that has been created, everything that has been formed, everything that has life, everything that's just laying on the ground, has a common connection to it, a common bond. And that is a connection to the Holy Bible which I believe to be the very Word of God. Now, I'm going to go, we're going to teach some math a little bit. Now, let me tell you about me a little bit, okay? Uh, I am not a mathematician. I use a calculator whenever I can. I still believe in doing things the old-fashioned way, writing it out and counting your fingers. I can actually count change back to someone without using a calculator, okay? Uh, it takes practice. I never did good in math. I didn't like math. I didn't comprehend math very well. I struggled through algebra in high school. And when I got that done, they said, you don't have to take any more. And I said, good, because I'm not. So I want you to know that I'm not a mathematician. 
But there are, I do like to see things that have a pattern to it. And we're actually taught, we're actually given a gift and ability inside of us, given to us by God, to be able to recognize patterns. And in whatever area of life, whatever walk of life you're in, whatever employment you're in, there are patterns that we learn to recognize. If you work in a factory, uh, then you know certain things happen a certain way. If you work in accounting, then you understand numbers and numbers must match up. If you work in the medical field, you know that there's an order and a pattern to everything that takes place. This because God is not, the Bible says, God is not the author. There's that word again. An author writes books. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. And so I believe that God lays out patterns for us. There was a mathematician by the name of Fibonacci back in the 1200s that wrote a book. And in this book, he identified a pattern of numbers that he could see in a lot of places, you know, just around where he looked. Let me show you what this pattern is. The pattern starts with zero. Then we go to the next number, which is one. If we add 1 plus 0, we get the next number in the sequence, which is 1. If we take then that number 1 and add it to the previous number, 1, we get the next number in the sequence, which is 2. If we add 2 plus 1, we have 3. If we add 3 plus 2, that's 5. 5 plus 3 is 8. 8 plus 5 is 13. 13 plus 8 is 21. And then the sequence continues. 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, 377, 610, 987. And it can go on to infinity. As the numbers go higher, mathematicians have found out, Fibonacci have found out, that they actually have what's called a ratio. Here's the ratio of the Fibonacci sequence. It's 1 to 1.618. If you were to take the numbers 610 and 987, you'll find that, the ratio, you'll find that 987 is approximately 1.618 times what 610 is. That's what you'll find. That's what the ratio is. It's called the Fibonacci sequence or the golden ratio or God's ratio. Fibonacci found out that if you take these, these numbers, if you take this Fibonacci sequence and you lay them out in blocks and draw a spiral in them, you'll see, let me show you this spiral. We have in the center of this spiral, we have one and one. Then we have the next box, which is, to, let's say that each box is, is uh, in inches. So we have two boxes that are one inch square. The next box in the sequence is going to be two inches square. The next one is going to be three inches, five inches, eight inches, and 13 inches. And I wanted you to notice very carefully the spiral that is inside of this thing. I want you to notice that as the spiral goes through box number 13, the end point is roughly in the same line as the beginning point. I, I want you to notice that because you're going to see that here in a little bit. Take a look at this. You've seen this before, haven't you? A seashell. Now I'm going to go back and forth to these two pictures. Notice the spiral. Notice that as the spiral spirals out, it expands. And it expands according to the Fibonacci sequence, or the golden ratio, 1 to 1.618. It's the same ratio. And I believe, and I'm going to show you in this video, that God is the one who designed that, and it's actually His signature on everything. Because I think that God wants everybody to know that He made this. It's sort of like an artist who does his very best work and he signs his name along the bottom. God literally put his signature on everything that is. Let's go to the Bible for understanding this. The book of Romans chapter 1, verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, Paul is telling us from the book of Romans, through the Holy Spirit, that God literally put his signature in everything that is. We're, we, can look, we can look at human beings, we can look at animals, we can look at seashells, and what we're going to see is we're going to see the signature of God in everything that he created. Let me show you this picture of the Fibonacci spiral again. Let me show you the seashell. 
Now take a look at this. You see this flower and all the petals in this flower. You see the Fibonacci spiral there. Here is some broccoli. Now I like broccoli. But notice that the same spiral and its outward expansion is exactly identical. Let's look at this plant here. This sort of reminds me of grass. Grass has the same spiral in it. If you take apart a, a blade of grass, when you get down to the middle of it, you have this exact same spiral. Notice that was the spiral starts and it, and it unfolds itself literally in the same pattern. It expands as it unrolls and then it sort of tails off. Notice here the, another rose, the petals outward expanding in a spiral with the same exact ratio. Notice this plant here, same ratio. A chameleon's tail. Notice as it starts in the center, it's small, and as it, as it unrolls, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It is following the exact same pattern. Now, that is things that are related to things that are living. Let me show you something that, well, there's a question, is it living, is it not living? Let me show you how this naturally occurs in nature, even amongst non-living things. Let me show you this picture here. What is this? It's a wave. And isn't it interesting? Nobody really causes waves like this. It's the, uh, you know, I was told in school that it's the, uh, the gravity of the moon pulling on that causes the tides and the waves to roll up and everything like that. You know, I just believe that. And so no one is actually causing this wave to act in this particular manner. But I want you to notice that at the peak of the wave, you have it swirling outward and expanding in almost I, I, the identical pattern that we saw in all of these other things. And if you haven't, you haven't been convinced yet, go home, fill your bathroom sink full of water, let the plug out, and watch what that water does. It doesn't just go down and go Phew. What happens is that it swirls its way into the drain. Same thing happens when you flush the toilet. Just go home. You want to see the handiwork of God? Go home and flush your toilet because you'll see the exact same spiral there. How is it that all of these things, and you know, I mentioned things that are not alive, actually water. Water has been determined by the scientists, the people who know everything, and of course by God himself. Water is essential for life. If there were no water on this planet, there would be no life. Why, why are we going to Mars? Why are we going to the moon and looking for water? We go to Mars looking for water because scientists know that if there's going to be life anywhere on Mars, there's going to have to be water there because water is the sustainer of all life. It is a common element that sort of binds all of life together. Everything that lives needs water. The Bible refers to the water of the Word of God in Ephesians chapter 5. And so here again we're being connected back with the Scriptures. But think again this idea that all of these things that are related to life in God's creation have this exact same Fibonacci spiral, this exact same golden sequence to them. That is the signature of God. Again, let's go back to the scriptures. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. I want you to notice that I'm doing exactly what John said we could do. We could actually handle the word of life. At some point, the, a lot of the disciples, a lot of the people that were following Jesus, uh, once they figured out he wasn't going to be the revolutionary against the tyrannical government of Rome, they started leaving him. They started walking away from him. Jesus looked at the 12 disciples and he said, Will thou also go? And Peter turned around and looked at him. And said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so the Bible is, declares itself to be the words of life. We've already seen from the scriptures that God created everything with the words of his mouth. Now we see that those things that are alive, and, and including water, they all bear this same signature or this same ratio or the same number pattern that is associated with life. And I want, you to, I want you to think about something here. And I'm going to show you a graphic up on the screen. Uh, back in the Old Testament days, they didn't write in, in books like this. They wrote in scrolls. 
And they would take and they would write out the words, the prophets, as they, the Bible teaches us that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so these holy men like Jeremiah and Isaiah and David, they would write out the things that God was telling them to write out. And they would take them and they would roll them up into scrolls. And as, that, as a, you take a piece of paper and you roll it up, and you'll, what you'll notice is that if you get it rolled up, and I can't do this with this piece of paper here because it'll just go back into its, but if you keep a piece of paper rolled up and then it gets bent into that shape and it's used to being rolled up, if you just let it go, you'll notice that it'll expand a little bit. And from the center of that scroll, the expansion becomes greater and greater and greater. And so even in, even in paper, these scrolls that these men, these 40 men of old, who wrote the words of God on, they were writing them on scrolls that were rolled up to fit the model of the Fibonacci sequence. We're looking at this number ratio, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on. We're looking at this number pattern as the sequence of life, and it is always associated with life. I'm going to show you a picture here. Now don't, don't gross out on me. Let me show you what this is. This is the umbilical cord that connects a mother with her unborn child. Why is it that the umbilical cord looks like a rolled up scroll? Or it looks like a water wave, or it looks like broccoli, or it looks like a flower, or it looks like a blade of grass. You know, the Bible says that all flesh is grass. And so grass has the Fibonacci spiral, and all human beings start their way out in life exactly the same with an umbilical cord tied to their mother that gives them nourishment, refreshment, that gives them life and blood and oxygen. And it all looks like the Fibonacci spiral. Even even in the early stages of life, as a baby begins to develop in the womb of its mother, its body takes on, notice the expansion of the spiral of the human fetus. It takes on the exact same Fibonacci sequence. One of the verses, I, one of the things I learned about God in my early years, the Bible says that even the very hairs of your head are numbered. You see, I think God pays attention to numbers. I think God is in mathematics. One of the things that I know about numbers is that they never end. There's a, there is never an end to a numerical sequence. It always keeps going. There's no beginning and there's no end. That's God. And by the way, numbers are always consistent. If I have five fingers and I go to China, it's still five fingers. And if I have five fingers here and I have five fingers here, and it's ten in America, if I go to China, it's still ten. If I go to Mars, it's still ten. Numbers never change, and they never have an ending. And that's who God is. And so God said, the very hairs of your head are numbered. And I want you to notice that here's a, here's a picture of a little boy's head. And I want you to notice that even the very hairs of his head follow this exact same spiral sequence, right? Starts right from the back of your head and just starts swirling around. And, you know, some guys, you know, that are losing their hair, their swirls seem to be bigger than everybody else's. But here, this little boy, and it's on everybody's head, that at the back of your head, this hair starts growing out, and it starts spiraling out over your head. God is showing you his signature, his pattern. Every time we look down upon our children, and we see the tops of their heads. We're seeing God's signature there. God is saying, I created this human being. From the very point of conception, the umbilical cord, the fetus, and now as he grows, you can see the exact same pattern. Let's expand out a little bit. Let's go back and look at these galaxies again. Because you see these galaxies now, they have the exact same spiral. And I want you to notice that the beginning of the spiral in the center... As it spirals around, it starts to tail off, notice that, in roughly a straight line with the beginning of the spiral. Let me go back to this graphic here. Notice that you have 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and 13. I want you to notice that pattern because that's the same pattern we see here in this graphic of these spiral galaxies. My daughter actually helped me out with this and I was explaining to her this Fibonacci sequence, showing her how it's used. And she said, Dad, that's 33. 
And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, Dad, if you add the numbers 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and 13, they end up with the number 33. Let me go back to this verse where, that we started at the beginning, Colossians 3.11. By the way, if you multiply 3 times 11, that's 33. But anyway, Colossians 3.11, Christ is all and in all. All things were created by him, by Christ. So the Bible says Christ is all and in all. In case you didn't know, when Jesus came to this earth, he was the Son of God, he was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. According to the Bible, he lived exactly... 33 years. And then he was crucified. Literally, the number that was on the age of Christ is the exact same sum of the numbers of the Fibonacci sequence that we see in every bit of the details of the creation of God. Let me get back to these. Uh, let me get back to these stars here for a minute. And remember, we're, we're throughout this video. We're going to group together this idea that the Fibonacci sequence and all of creation and everything is related to Jesus Christ, and it's related to the Word of God. We go back and look at these stars. I could look at star pictures all day long. I just absolutely love to look at Hubble telescope pictures and everything else of the stars. And I believe, once again, that God created those stars. And everything that God creates has a message for mankind, including the stars. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handy work. In other words, the firmament of the stars in heaven showeth his, the word handy work, it's his signature. Okay? Uh, even without a signature, those who study art can look at a painting and go, yes, I believe that's an early Van Gogh. See, they know because of the brush, the, the handy work. They recognize it because everybody, no matter what they do, has a pattern to what they do. Handwriting experts. I sign my handwrite, I sign my signature a certain way. A handwriting expert, my wife, could look at that and say, yeah, that's my husband's signature. Why? Because I do it in a pattern, exactly the same. And so the creation of God has a pattern, it has a signature, it has, it declares his handiwork. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Now notice this. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now what David, 3,000 years ago, what David is describing here, who had no telescopes, he had no spaceships to go out and look, he was telling by the inspiration of God that even the stars of heaven have a, have a speech. They have, a, they have something to say to mankind. Now remember, I want you to, I'm going to put these two things together. We have the stars in, the, in, their, in their galaxies, and uh, we have the, the old time men writing the Word of God on these scrolls, and they're rolled up. I want you to think about a spiral galaxy and these scrolls, and how they look almost identical, the same spiral. So I want you to look now at two places in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Two places in the Bible, these two verses say nearly identical the same thing. By the way, I just counted the exact words in both Isaiah 34, 4 and Revelation 6, 14, and you have exactly 66 words in these two verses. That just happens, in case you don't know this, that just happens to be the exact number of books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way book to the book of Revelation, 66 books in this Bible. And so watch this. The Bible is telling you that literally the stars, the clusters of the stars are rolled together as scrolls. And they have God's identifying handiwork on them. Um, I know a little bit about music. I play the piano. I play a little guitar. I play a few other things. And I noticed this, that on a piano keyboard, 
We have what's called an octave. This first note here, I want you to notice that piano keys are divided up between white and black keys. I want you to notice these two black keys here. The note that is right before them, the white key that is right before them is called C, middle C. Um, the music notes go from A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and then it starts all over again. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. It starts all over again. So even music and the notes on a piano are in a recognizable pattern, a pattern that those who play the piano and those who play other instruments, it's a pattern that they get used to. Everything is in a pattern in this world. I want you to notice, let's look at these Fibonacci numbers again, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, and 13. I want you to notice on a piano keyboard that there are, between an octave, between 1C and the next highest C, that's called an octave. Why? Because the word oct is the, is the word for Eight. I want you to notice that eight is a Fibonacci number. I want you to notice that there are two black keys in a group. Two is a Fibonacci number. I want you to notice that there are three black keys in the next group. Three is a Fibonacci number. And when you add them, all the black keys together, there are five in total. And then you have the eight white keys from one C to the next C. That's a Fibonacci number. And so when you add all of the white keys and all the black keys together, you end up with the number 13. Here we have this, this number sequence again. 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8 plus 13 equals, here we are back to the number 33 again. And so we've seen that Christ is in the cauliflower. Christ is in the broccoli. He's in the sunflowers. He's in the ocean waves. Christ's signature is in the very stars of heaven. And Christ's signature is in music. Christ is all and in all, the Bible says. I hope, I hope I'm convincing you that there's something more to the universe than what the lecturers and the biologists and the science teachers taught you in school. I hope that you're recognizing that there's something more out there. Let's look at something else in nature. Something that man does not have the ability to form. That is clouds. Look at this. That's a hurricane. You can clearly see the exact same Fibonacci spiral in the hurricane. Now, a hurricane probably is the biggest thing that is on planet Earth, a hurricane. I, I can't think of anything, any one single thing that would be actually bigger than a hurricane. Mountain, hurricanes are bigger than mountains. Hurricanes are bigger than lakes. Maybe it's, it's not as big as the ocean, but it's the ocean that brought these hurricanes to begin with. Okay, More like they birthed them. Remember water. Water and, and clouds are made of water, which goes back to life. And now we see the scroll here, which takes us back to the very Word of God. And I, here again, I like to look at clouds too. They bear the signature of God. And here again, I want you to notice that the spiral of the hurricane starts, it expands out, and then it tails off in, the, in a line with its beginning. That is 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8 plus 13. That is that exact same Fibonacci spiral, and that equals the number 33. Now, let me connect some things together for you. Because the Bible consistently refers to Jesus Christ, who was 33 years old. The Bible consistently refers to Jesus Christ as the Word. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In Revelation chapter 19, Jesus comes back to the earth, riding on a white horse, and he has a name written on him. And that name is the Word of God. God. So I want you to think of Jesus Christ being the Word, being the Creator, and I want you to think of everything in creation being associated with Jesus and His Word. Let's go to the book of Job. See, they're not called hurricanes. They're only called hurricanes uh, in North America. They're called typhoons. They're called other things in different places of the earth. The Bible refers to them, and listen to this, you'll like this. The Bible refers to them as whirlwinds. Whirlwinds. Because that's what they do. They whirl around in a Fibonacci spiral. In the book of Job, notice two verses here. Job 38.1, Then the Lord answered Job 
out of the whirlwind and said, Job chapter 40, verse 6, Then answered the Lord unto Job, out of the whirlwind and said. So here again, watch this now. Remember the stars. The stars, clusters of galaxies in the Fibonacci spiral. And Psalm 19 said that they have speech, that they utter and declare the glory of God. Here we have the Fibonacci spiraled whirlwinds and God is speaking out of the whirlwind. Fibonacci sequence, the spiral, the word of God and Jesus Christ, they're all linked together. And so watch this now, you're gonna like this, okay? This thing is gonna get better and better as we go on. God speaks, there's, there's a verse in the Bible that says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So God speaks out of the whirlwind, Fibonacci spiral. We hear God with our ears. Think about your ear. Now look at the graphic of the ear. It's in a spiral too. In fact, it's at the same ratio, 1 to 1.618, as the whirlwind that God is speaking out of, the stars of heaven that are speaking that are rolled together as a scroll, the scroll itself. So when God speaks, it's associated with that same ratio, that same spiral. And when we hear, it's associated with that exact same spiral. But it, it gets better than that. Because some people, they don't, you know, they, they hear, but they, they, they can listen. They hear, but they don't listen. So it goes from the outer ear to this here. This is called the inner ear. And the very thing that God is speaking with the whirlwind, the heavens, the scroll, the Fibonacci spiral, now is going to the spiral of our outer ear, and now is going to the spiral of our inner ear. And it's all associated, so God speaking and us hearing is all associated with the exact same sequence. Maybe, just maybe, there's more to this universe and this creation than what you were taught in high school or what you were taught in college. Maybe there's just more to it than that. So let's go back and look at this again. Psalm 19, verse 1, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. By the way, musician, music, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight keys in an octave, two black keys, three, three black keys, the Fibonacci sequence in music. So we have psalms, 150 psalms, and they're full of music. So we have music. We have the stars of the firmament in a Fibonacci spiral uttering speech. And the Bible says there is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. So music and speech and the stars and the scrolls and the whirlwind and the ears of human beings, they all follow the exact same Fibonacci sequence. Let me show you this. What is this? It's a ram's horn. I want you to notice that the ram's horn follows the exact same sequence. You see the spiral, it expands out, and it tails off into the skull of the ram at nearly the identical place where it started. That is 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8 plus 13, which all equals 33. Let me show you how a ram's horn was used in the scriptures. Joshua chapter 6, verse 5, And it shall come to pass that when, when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. You know, this, this is the story of Joshua and the battle of Jericho. So God said, take a ram's horn, and I want you to make a sound with the ram's horn, and the people are going to hear the ram's horn. So here we have the ram's horn, Fibonacci spiral. It's indicative of how God speaks, and I'll show you that. And then it goes into the ears, same Fibonacci spiral. Numbers chapter 10, the Bible's going to describe what trumpets are all about. The Bible says, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. That Notice that they were two trumpets made out of silver. I want you to stop right here. The Bible is clearly identified in two ways. It is divided up as Old Testament 
and New Testament. And so the two trumpets of silver would represent the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Scriptures. And I want you to, I want you to remember this pattern because we're going to see this again here in just a little bit. You're going to like this, okay? So watch this. Notice that there were two trumpets and notice that they were to be made out of silver. Psalm chapter 12 verse 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times and so the bible's telling us that the words of the lord are pure just like the pure silver that these two trumpets were made out of then in revelation book of revelation is an interesting book because john who was in his upper 90s he was an old he was the oldest disciple that had lived he had lived long, longer than any of the other disciples and he was in exile on the isle of patmos and he was praying to the lord one day in the book of revelation chapter 1 you can read this and all of a sudden he heard a voice behind him revelation chapter 1 verse 10 i was in the spirit on the lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Notice the word heard and the word voice. Remember the, the heavens have a voice and the word trumpet all together. Guess whose voice that when John when John heard the voice as of trumpet, when he turned around and looked, guess who he saw? He saw Jesus. The words of Jesus. A trumpet, Fibonacci spiral, being heard, the voice, like the voice of the of these of the stars. And then we have the hearing. John heard it in his Fibonacci spiraled outer ear and inner ear. Now, the largest thing in the universe is these clusters of galaxies, and most of them are in this Fibonacci spiral. The, so the largest things in the entire universe have the Fibonacci sequence encoded into them. God's signature. Now we're going to see that the smallest thing in the universe has the exact same pattern. It's scientists refer to it as deoxyribonucleic acid. We simply, we can't hardly say those words all together, so we reduce it down to DNA. And you've seen DNA before, haven't you? DNA looks like a ladder, but it's not a straight ladder. It's a spiral ladder. The spiral DNA, it's called the double helix. Remember there were two trumpets? There were two parts of the word, Old Testament, New Testament. Here is DNA. It is the double helix. And I want you to notice, angstroms is a unit of measurement. It's very, 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 very small. In fact, DNA cannot even be seen with a microscope because actually the molecules of DNA are actually smaller than light waves itself. But anyway... Follow the Fibonacci pattern, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and I want you to notice that DNA at its base, from one rung to the next rung over, is 21 angstroms wide, and from the bottom of one spiral to the top of that same spiral, when it comes back around again, that measurement is 34 angstroms tall. So DNA has the, the spiral of DNA has the exact same sequence in it, the Fibonacci sequence. Now, here's where, we're, here's where it's going to get interesting. Because we're going to see that the Bible is going to tell us that DNA and the star cluster galaxies and water waves and the whirlwinds and the trumpet, the ram's horn and all of these things, they're all linked with the Holy Bible and Jesus Christ himself. Because if it's life and it's created by God, it bears his signature. Now, let me, let me show you this, okay? This is a depiction of the temple that Solomon built uh, right after the time of David, about a thousand years uh, before Christ. I, the, if you follow the language of the scriptures, you'll understand really what the body or the temple is all about. First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So literally now, I want you to understand this. Literally, the Bible is telling you that your body, the one that you're living in right now, the one that you possess, 
the body that God built by speaking. Remember, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God spoke man into existence. Man's body is the temple or the dwelling place of God Almighty. And in this temple resides a copy of the scroll, the Word of God, inside of this temple. Now, I want you to understand this because we're going to connect some things. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 19. Remember the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork, day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. And so the stars in, and their scrolled up ways are showing to us and revealing to us the very word of God. Notice as we continue in Psalm 19, the Bible says their line is gone out through all the earth. And stop right here. The line is is what we would call these lines of Scripture. We write words in lines. And so the Bible says their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world, in them, meaning the heavens, hath he, God, set a tabernacle for the sun. So here's what God's doing. God is showing you that he built, he had Solomon build a temple. Uh, Moses erected a tabernacle, which is a movable type of temple. It was the dwelling place of God. We're going to see some neat things about the tabernacle, too. The, the tabernacle, the temple, the universe is a picture of the tabernacle. And our bodies are a picture of the tabernacle or the temple of God. And all of them contain a copy of the Word of God. Now, let's go back to this graphic image of the temple. I want you to notice... And this was done according to, the, according to God's plan, that this temple was built with stones. Okay, It was built of, of stones, and it was put together piece by piece. I want you to think about the human body. You see, because the human body is not just one dense solid, it is actually a, a body that is composed and put together just like the temple was built, of stones. These stones are called cells. You have skin cells, hair cells, eye cells, you have blood cells, you have everything in the body is composed of these little bitty stones called cells. Let's go back to the scriptures now. First Peter chapter 2 verse 5, the Bible says, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Um, in our local church congregation, our church uh, re represents the body of Christ. It is not built of, of just one person. One person is not the church. It's a group of people meeting together, worshiping, following the scriptures. We are the stones that are building up the temple of this local congregation. Likewise, all of those who believe in Jesus and trust in the word of God are the whole house of God, the lively stones, just like the cells of our body that make up the temple that you and I dwell in. Now, um, as you've probably figured out before, I like to count things. I like to, I, I believe that wisdom comes from counting things in the scriptures. And I noticed the word temple kept showing up over and over and over. So I decided to just kind of look and see how many times the word temple or temples was used in the scripture. Now, there's a couple of references to the word temple that means like, you know, the side of the head. So I excluded those because those don't refer to like a building or a dwelling place. The number of times the word temple or temples is used in the scriptures is exactly 208 times. According, and depending on what source you look at, there are 208 bones in the human body. There's some, some people say 206, but it, I think it has something to do with the sternum and how you count the sternum. But from the source that I use, Wikipedia, 208 bones in the human body, and that matches perfectly with the exact number of times that the word temple or temples is used. And so I want you to understand this. The human skeletal system, if we believe, now listen to this now, if we believe that the skeleton was built by God, spoken by his word, then everything about our skeleton is going to follow a pattern given to us in the scriptures. Let me show you this. This is the, uh, this is the rib cage. 
In case you don't know, I want you to notice that we have a series of ribs on one side and on the other. They're joined together in the front by the sternum, joined together in back by the spine. In case you've never counted, there are 12 ribs on the left side and 12 ribs on the right, on the right side. And notice, in, see the rib cage is like a, it's like a shield, okay? Because it shields and protects the vital organs of the body. What are those vital organs? Number one, it's the heart, the human heart. And how many places in the Bible refer to uh, the human heart? The human heart represents the throne of God. Because when someone is saved, we say that Jesus now dwells in them or lives inside of their heart. Incidentally, incidentally, the human heart has four chambers. In the Old Testament depiction of the throne of God, which was the Ark of the Covenant, we see that according to the law that God wrote, the Ark of the Covenant was to be carried by exactly four Levite priests. This is a picture of what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1 and what John saw in Revelation chapter 4 was four living creatures or four cherubs that suspended the throne of God. So the heart of mankind literally is the throne of God where he dwells and where he lives. It's where life emanates from. And then in Revelation chapter 4 verse 6, John says, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Surrounding the human heart is a sack of water called the pericardium. That water is salt water just like the sea of glass that John saw in Revelation chapter 4. Absolutely amazing. And then we have, then we have inside of, of that rib cage, we have the lungs. And I want you to notice that there are two of them. And the lungs supply breath. Breath in the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit, the breath of of God as we breathe in and out we're actually supplying oxygen through our heart to the rest of the body that's what gives us life if we lose our lungs if we lose our heart then we cannot live and so we have a picture here of the heart uh, the the human lungs by the way let me let me get this let me go to Revelation chapter 4 beautiful beautiful place here in the scripture and I want you to see this because we have a picture in Revelation 4 of the throne of God. And John is describing it like this. He says in Revelation 4, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Okay, think of Fibonacci spiral. Talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you the things which must be hereafter. And the Bible says in verse 2, and Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, and the sight like an emerald. And I want you to notice this. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. By the way, your voice is given to you by the lungs. It's right here. Lightnings and thunderings. Have you ever listened to a heartbeat? What does it sound like? It sounds like thunder. You know what activates the heart? Electricity. Lightnings and thunderings. And a voice coming out of this throne area of God. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We mentioned the two lungs. They're a picture of the Old and New Testament of the Bible. They are the spirits of God. And the Bible says there are seven of these spirits. Um, read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and you'll find out what those spirits represent. But here we have the two lungs that deliver oxygen to the heart and thence to the bloodstream. These blood vessels that go to the heart are in what's called vascular bundles or nodes. Okay, And you'll have a vascular bundle here and one here and one here. You just happen to have seven of these vascular bundles that take the oxygen from the lungs, distribute it by way of the heart into the bloodstream of the human being. Are you Look at this. We have the seven spirits of God. We have the throne of God. And then watch this. Here's the skeleton. Okay, here's the skeleton. We have 12 ribs on this side. We have 12 ribs on this side. And they surround everything that's in the middle. 
According to Revelation chapter 4, around about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. What color are bones, by the way? They're white, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And so, I'm just wanting to show you that you were created, literally, to be the temple of God. Here's the throne. It's in the four-chamber heart, surrounded by the seven spirits of God and the two lungs and the seven vascular bundles, and all of that is surrounded by 24 ribs that are dressed in white. You see, there's more about you than what you learned in high school biology. You were literally created by God to be the temple of God. Let's look at another part of our skeleton. Let's look at our hand. Our hands are absolutely fascinating. And if I were to take my hand and, and do this with it, I'm going to show you a close-up. You see that when my fingers curl in like this, it makes the Fibonacci spiral. And so our hands are a representation of the signature of God. Let's look at an x-ray of the hand. Here you have, let's look at the index finger of this hand. Uh, we have this part here and this part here and this part. It's all divided into sections. And I'll just kind of look at it. You'll notice that this part of your finger is a little bit longer than this part, and this part of your finger is longer than this part, and then you have a bone right in here that's longer than this part, and I'm going to show you this. Because if we were to take, remember the Fibonacci sequence, the, the, the two in the sequence, when added together, make up the sum of the next number in the sequence. So if we take the top two parts of your finger, and we place them alongside the third bone of your finger, you'll find that the third bone is the same length as the first two bones put together. That's the Fibonacci sequence. If we were to take it to one more thing, the third bone of your finger along with the second bone of your finger added together make the fourth bone that's inside of your hand. It is the exact, from here all the way down to here, it is designed by God with his signature to be, to be the exact same Fibonacci pattern that we see in clouds, that we see in water, that we see in the swirls of hair, that we see in DNA, that we see... I mean, we see it every place in creation, including the making of our hands. This is interesting because, remember, all of this is going to connect now with the Word of God. Let's go back to the Scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 10. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. God took and put his signature upon the two tables. Think of the two trumpets and the two spirits, and now we have two tables of stones. Think of the two spirals of DNA. So now we have the Fibonacci sequence in our finger, God's finger writing out his law, his commandments, on two tables of stone. This is where it gets really interesting. And this, if I haven't convinced you yet that you are a unique and a special creation of God, I hope to with everything that I lay out in this video teaching. Because I want to show you, I, I count things. And I think that everything about me matches what's in this Bible. Think of the Word of God. Think of the two divisions of the Word of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, you have exactly 27 books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it goes all the way through to the book of Revelation. You have exactly 27 books. I, I want you to think of like this too, okay? We have a left side to the Bible and a right side to the Bible, okay? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and according to the scriptures, one of these testaments is actually stronger and has more power than the other. In my body, I am right-handed. My right hand actually has more strength than my left hand. In the Bible, the New Testament has more power. The Old Testament declares that we're all sinners, that none of us are good. That's what the Old Testament says. It says that we, it gives us the law, tells us to keep the law, but the problem is we can't keep the law. So the Bible says that the Old Testament is weak. It represents the weak side of the body. On me, it's the left hand. The New Testament is strong because Christ died for our sins, paid the price for us, and so now we have the strength of the right hand. In this New Testament, you have 27 books on the right side of the Bible. In every human hand, naturally formed, you have exactly 
27 bones from here all the way down to here in your right hand. Look at what the Bible says about the right hand. Exodus 15, 6, Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Psalm 17, 7, Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand. Psalm 20, verse 6, Talks about the saving strength of his right hand. Psalm 60 verse 5. Save with thy right hand and hear me. Psalm 63 8. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Psalm 78 54. He hath brought them to the border of his sanctuary. Even to this mountain which his right hand had purchased. See it's the right hand of God. Represented by the New Testament. And just happens to have 27 books, 27 bones in our hand that represents the saving power. Now think about this. Where is Jesus right now? According to the Bible, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. There's something else in God's right hand. We'll see it in a little bit. But I want you to think of the right hand being a picture of Jesus Christ. There's a story in the Old Testament. I absolutely love this story. When I first read this, and God showed me what it meant. I wept at how marvelous and how beautiful the arrangement of the Bible and God himself is. We have the story of Moses. God wants to use Moses to deliver his people from their bondage. That's you and I in the bondage that we're in under sin. And God wants to deliver his people from their bondage. And so God is telling Moses, I'm Moses, I'm going to send you down to Egypt. You're going to deliver your people. And Moses has some doubts. He said, Lord, I don't know. He said, they kicked me out 40 years ago for murdering somebody. And I don't know that they're going to let me back in. And God said, let me, let me give you a sign. Let me show you what I'm going to do. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible says, And the Lord said further unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. Now I'm going to stop right here. Jesus said in John chapter 1, that he came from the bosom of his father. He was literally at his right hand in his bosom. Jesus came from the bosom of his father. So here's Moses. And God says, Moses, take your hand and, and put it in your bosom. So he puts it in his bosom. Now watch this. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. I love the Bible. The Bible says that leprosy is a picture of sinfulness. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, Isaiah says. And so here is Jesus when he comes the first time upon Christ at his first coming. When he comes from the bosom of the Father, he comes and upon Christ, the Bible says, is laid all the sins of the world is on him. Even though Jesus never sinned, he is bearing our iniquities on his body. So then, so that's Moses brings his hand out of his bosom. His hand is leprous as snow. Verse 7. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand in, into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass that they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And I want you to get this. When Jesus comes the first time, he bears on him the sins of mankind. He then goes back to the bosom of the Father, literally the right hand of the Father to make that eternal offering of His blood for the sins of mankind. He's coming again. He's going to leave the bosom of the Father again. He's going to come again. And the Bible says when He comes the second time, He will come without sin. And He is coming again. And all of this is pictured by the right hand. Let's look at the human spine. Did you know that the human spine, speaking of Fibonacci sequence, has exactly 33 bones in it. That's a picture of Jesus Christ. And it's in Ezekiel chapter 33. Here again we go back to Moses. Moses wants to see the face of God. God said, no man can see my face and live. And so he didn't want Moses to die. So he said, Moses, here's what I'm going to do. You come up to the mountain. Remember, this is in Exodus 33. And we have the 33 bones of the back bone, the back parts of human beings. God says, I'm not going to show you my face. In Ezekiel 33, verse 23, I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. 
Do you know who, so God was revealing a, a number, a symbol to Moses, and that was his back. It was the number 33. Jesus then is the revelation of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Then we get into the skull, the head. This is where the face is. The skull has 22 bones in it. Can you think of a story in the Bible that has to do something with a skull? John chapter 19, verse 17. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. You know what the number 22 represents in the scriptures? represents Revelation. Did you know there's 22 chapters in the book of Revelation? Did you know there's 66 books total in the Bible? That's 22 times 3. Did you know that in the 22nd book of the Bible, Genesis, or excuse me, 22nd chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 22, we have a foreshadowing of God offering up His only begotten Son as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. It's Abraham offering up Isaac on the altar. There's a revelation in Genesis 22. There's a revelation in Psalm 22. You know what it says? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those are the exact words spoken by Jesus when he was in the place of the skull. And so man, I want you to get this, man in his fallen state, in his wicked, sinful state, cannot see the face of God now because of our sin. Christ dies in the place of the skull, 22 bones, so that now the veil between us and God can be taken away and God can be revealed. Notice what's going to happen in the very end of everything according to Revelation chapter 22. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face. It's all going to be revealed one of these days. Now, that's, the, that's, the, that's a sort of a digest of the human skeleton, the bones, 208 bones, the word temple, 208 times in the scriptures. And now we're going to look at something a little bit smaller and get a greater understanding out of all of this. It's the human cell. Remember, the temple was made of cells... And these cells have an identifiable pattern to them. We're going to see that. I want you to notice that in every cell of your body, you have a similar structure. You have the cell wall. You have all these apparatuses inside the cell. And then in the middle of the cell, you have the cell nucleus. In the cell nucleus, you have 23 pairs of what are called chromosomes. Your chromosomes is where... Your DNA is stored. Now, we're going to talk about DNA for a minute. We're going to understand a little bit about DNA. Remember, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a biologist. I'm not much of a scientist, I can tell you that. And so some of this stuff I remember reading and hearing about in high school and in college. I remember hearing things on the news and so on. So I had to go back and I had to study things about DNA again. And, I'm, and I, to me, things have to be fairly simple. So I'm going to try to make this fairly simple for everybody. In every cell in our body, we have in the middle of that cell a nucleus. In that nucleus are 23 pairs, or actually 46. I want you to remember that number. 46 packages of DNA, sort of like 46 grocery sacks of DNA, called chromosomes. Inside of those chromosomes are bundles of this, remember the DNA spiral is like a Fibonacci spiral, has the same pattern, of the double helix of DNA. Let me show you how DNA uh, basically looks. And let me, let me just say this. Everything that we know about DNA is about 50 years old. Most of what we know about DNA, and we're learning more every day, most of what we know about DNA is about 10 to 15 years old. We're just gaining our, our knowledge and increasing our knowledge of how it is that we're built. And it seems funny to me that the more we find out about how we're made, the less likely to me that it becomes that anybody could ever believe that we were made and put here by accident. And I'll explain why I said that here in a minute. You notice that DNA sort of looks like a spiral ladder. The two rungs of that ladder, or the sides, are called sugar phosphate 
backbones. That's an interesting word, okay? The, the rungs of the ladder, the things that are joining this ladder together, they're called base pairs. In other words, it's like two pieces of a puzzle that join together to join this section of DNA with this section of DNA here. These base pairs, are you ready for this? There's four of them. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. Now, you don't need to remember that for a test, but let's break it down and let's make it simple. Let's just call them A, T, G, and C. Now, this is, this is where it gets really interesting. Because adenine, and you have the other base pairs, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine, when adenine is over here, according to the rules, it can only link together with thiamine. In other words, there's a fitting here and a fitting here. Those of you who maybe do electrical work or plumbing or anything like that or computers, you know that most things on a computer, there's a, a cable can only go in one place in a computer, like a network cable or a USB or whatever. So you have adenine here and it can only link together with thiamine. Now this is interesting because when DNA is replicated from one cell to the next, the cell knows how to replicate it because, because of the rules. If adenine is here, then it must create a thiamine base pair on this side to join it together. That's the rules. Hence, you have adenine linking together with thiamine. Guanine always links together with cytosine. That's very, very important because it's actually written in the Bible that it's supposed to be that way. You'll see that in a little bit. So, here we have the base pairs joining together. And you might have adenine here and thymine here. You might have guanine here and cytosine here. And as adenine joins together with thymine and guanine with cytosine, in a certain order or a certain, remember, everything in the world has patterns. In a certain pattern, then the joining together in sequence of these base pairs forms what's called genes, hence the word the genetic code. It's interesting that the very first book of the Bible has the word genes in it. Genesis, which means beginnings, and the word genes is literally our beginnings, how we got started. And so here it is, and here's, here's the thing, you've heard on the news like... Um, You'll hear uh, uh, scientists, uh, genetic scientists have discovered the gene in women that causes um, a cancer of some kind. Here's the reason why genetic scientists were able to figure out what gene is that they discovered that DNA was not just a random sequence that they would never be able to figure it out. When they started looking at it, they started understanding that there was an order and a structure to the sequencing of genes. And so you'll have a pattern of base pairs joining together and that'll form a gene and then they know that that gene has been formed and the next sequence is going to form a new gene and the reason why they know that is is that in between the sequence that makes this gene and the sequence that makes this gene is a part of DNA that they call stop DNA. So you have a pattern of genes, you have a stop sequence, you have another pattern of genes and a stop sequence. You know, you know what they figured out? That DNA is just like a book that you read. Because in books, we don't just have a we don't write books with a long sequence of letters that never stop. We put letters together to form words, and we put words together to form sentences, whole complete thoughts, and when that sentence is done, we put a period, or sometimes a question mark, or whatever, exclamation point, but we put a punctuation mark at the end of that to show us that this complete thought has ended, and now a new complete thought has started. That is exactly the way DNA is formed. It's written exactly like a book and the genetic scientists are now learning how to read the book which by the way they're also learning how to rewrite the book that's a different video that we actually have and here's the interesting thing this is where we're going to get back now to the scriptures uh, this came out uh, I think 2004 2006 something like that University of Ohio released a study that they had discovered the 22nd 
amino acids. See these, these, these base pairs joined together to form amino acids. These amino acids are, the, are like the letters in the words, and the words join together to make the genes, and then this gene sequence is done, so there's a period at the end, and a new sentence or a new gene sequence is started. The formation of the base pairs forms what's called amino acids. There are exactly 22 of these amino acids that make the letters, that make the words, that make the sentences, which are the genes of the book of your DNA. Now that is very interesting. If we go to our Bible, we find revealed to us in the pages of this Bible a particular psalm. It's Psalm 119. You shouldn't have problem finding it because it's like the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119 is divided up. You'll see in, in your King James Bible that at the beginning of Psalm 119, it starts with Aleph. You know what that is? That's the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is what the Old Testament was written in. Then you have Beth. That's the second letter. And then eight verses down, you have Gimel, and then Daleth, and then He, and Va, and Zain, and Cheth, and Teth. You have all of these Hebrew letters, and if you just count to the end of Psalm 119, you'll find out that the Hebrew language that the Old Testament was written in was written in exactly 22 letters. The exact same number of letters that the amino acids are that make the genes that form the book of your DNA. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to this for a minute. I want you to think about that. Here we have musical notes. We have the scroll of the Bible. We have our hands. We have ram's horns. We have ears. We have everything in creation, including our DNA. Including our DNA basically shows the handiwork of God and the signature of God in the Fibonacci spiral. Now let's go back to this DNA. This, what, what said scientists now have determined is a book. Let's go back to this book, deoxyribonucleic acid. Remember, it's written in letters and it has 22 of those. And those 22 letters make words called genes. And those gene sequences form patterns like paragraphs and sentences in a book. And all of your DNA together basically is the book of your life. If you have a kitty cat, your kitty cat has DNA. It has different DNA than you. So its book is written a little bit differently. But your book is written to make out exactly who you are. Now... The discovery that DNA was encoded like a book is only about 10 to 15 years old. I don't remember when it first came out, but that's about how old it is as far as our knowledge of that. So how is it? I'm going to show you a verse out of the Old Testament written by David 3,000 years ago. Those of you who say, oh, the Bible is written by men. and How is it then? Let me give you an example. How is it then that Solomon knew that the, um, that the earth had the circuits of a water table. He describes in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 how the water goes into the rivers, the rivers run into the ocean, and the ocean is not full, and then the water from the ocean turns back into the clouds and it comes down as rain, and it starts all over again. How is it that Solomon knew that? God had revealed it to him. How is it that the Old Testament prophet knew that the earth was actually round instead of flat like everybody else had said. God had revealed it to him. Now I'm going to show you this verse, Psalm 139 verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. You know what David's saying? David's saying that my life and the formation of my entire life is written in in a book, even before I had hands, fingers, feet, and a heart, they were already written out. Let me illustrate it for you this way. In thy book, the book of DNA, all my members, notice a family has members, a body has members, all my members were written, which in continuance was fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. We all know that from the moment of conception, we don't look like a human being. We look like a circle with a little dot in it inside of it. That's the cell nucleus. 
But already written out, since we don't have arms, fingers, hands, hair, heart, bladders, we don't have anything like that, bones, we don't have anything like that, and yet inside that circle is a book written out. And that book has already set the sequence of how it's going to form over time. It's going to form hands. It's going to form a heartbeat. It's going to form blood. It's going to form a brain. It's going to form toenails. It's going to form all of the parts, all of the members of the body. So that verse literally means that our members are written in a book. And they were continually fashioned, even from the beginning, when there was none of them fashioned. David was describing, before mankind can even use a microscope to see the conception of life, David was describing it perfectly the way it is. And notice that, and I want you to get this now. Notice that David is saying that it's in thy book. So if DNA is written like a book... Who wrote it? God. You see, we would never think that if we took three million pieces of paper, put it out into a, an empty field, and put a typewriter out there, or let's say a computer, we would never think ever that if we just set it out there by itself, that a book would form, let's say, 15 million years later. We would never think that. So it's the same idea that when we discover that DNA is a book, we know for a fact books don't write themselves. They have an author. That author is the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Remember, I'm going to show you some things about DNA and how it relates to the book of the Bible. Remember, let's go back to adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. Let's look at these base pairs for a minute, and there are four of them. And I'm going to show you something really, really interesting here, and why there's four, and how they connect together. Remember, adenine only goes with thiamine, and guanine only goes with cytosine. Okay, that's the rules. That's the rules that are determined by the author of the book. I want you to notice in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16, seek ye out the book of the Lord. That's the Word of God, and that's the DNA sequence of man. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. In other words, God is telling Isaiah, Isaiah, write this down. This is going to be the pattern for life. This is the structure of DNA. Is that when the base pairs join together, if there's adenine here, there's always going to be thymine here. If there's cytosine here, there's always going to be guanine over here. Those who study the Bible, and I mean really study the Bible, know that the Old Testament always connects with the New Testament. It always joins together. Let me give you an illustration. In the fourth book of the Bible, the book of Numbers, we have a story of the people murmuring and sinning against God and God releasing serpents in among them, and it's killing them. And they cry out to God, and God says to Moses, make a, make a pole, a brass pole, and put a serpent on it, and raise that serpent up. And when the people look upon that thing, I will save them from the serpents that are biting them, and I will let them live. We go to the fourth book of the New Testament. And Jesus said in John chapter 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Old Testament, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see, the New Testament is connecting together perfectly, just as adenine and thymine together with the Old Testament. They join together. None, literally, shall want her mate. The interesting thing about these four base pairs, we have adenine, guanine, cytosine. Chemically, Adenine, guanine, and cytosine are similar. Thiamine is different because when you only have one strand of nucleic acid, it's not deoxyribonucleic acid. It's actually ribonucleic acid. When one strand, it's RNA. You've heard those letters before. RNA contains adenine, guanine, cytosine, and a fourth base pair called uracil. Okay? When you, when you add the second strand of the ribonucleic acid, it now becomes DNA and uracil is removed and now it's replaced with a chemical called thiamine. So here we have a pattern. We have adenine, guanine, cytosine, but now we have something different. We have thiamine. 
And I'm going to put this up on the screen. I want you to notice we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Anybody that studied the scriptures will know that if you just read it, you'll find out that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell a very similar story in the Bible. Okay? They're called the synoptic gospels because they seem to synchronize with one another. And everybody who studied this knows that John is different. And so watch this. Here we have one rung of the, we have one side of the ladder of DNA. We have another side of the ladder of DNA, and they're going to join together how? By way of four base pairs. What is it that joins the Old Testament with the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all follow the exact same pattern. Now, going back to this image of DNA, we see that DNA looks like, when it's, when it's not all coiled up in that Fibonacci spiral, we see that DNA looks like a ladder. Can you think of a story in the Bible that has something to do with a ladder? Jacob's ladder, Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Now I want you to notice the description of this ladder given to us. This ladder is none other, remember, DNA and the Word of God and everything like This ladder is none other than Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 51, the Bible says, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon who? Upon the Son of Man. Jesus Christ literally is the ladder, hence He is the Word of God, hence He is the book of life in our DNA. Remember the temple that Solomon built. Solomon actually put a very peculiar thing inside of his temple. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, the door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house, and they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle into the third. And so from the lower level of the temple to the upper level of the temple, Solomon built a spiral staircase in there. That's exactly the picture of DNA. So in Solomon's temple, he put a representation of the spiral ladder of DNA in it. Absolutely amazing. See, literally, your body is the temple of God. And so inside of the wilderness tabernacle, I want you to get this, inside of the wilderness tabernacle, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and it had the Book of the Law. In other words, it had a copy, literally, the, the stones, the copy of the Ten Commandments. And when we look at DNA, we see that in one helical turn, one spin of DNA, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stairs in it exactly in one helical turn. By the way, the word stairs is mentioned exactly ten times in the scriptures. Let's go back to Psalm 139 again. In thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. This is the first occurrence of the word book in the Bible. This is the book of the what? Notice the word. Generations. Do you know the word generations has the word gene in it? This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God created he him. And so the Bible is telling you that the whole Bible literally matches the book of our genes. And our genes all came from Adam. They're all passed down from us to, to us. And they're written in the book that God wrote. Notice Jeremiah chapter 36. Then Jeremiah called Barak the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the mouth of the Lord all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And remember, that's exactly what DNA is. When we look at this Fibonacci sequence, we see 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and 34, and so on. I want you to notice that if we compound those by a factor of 10, we have 10, 10, 20, and 30. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 2, he said, I see a flying roll, which is a scroll of a book. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. The length and the breadth of the flying roll that was seen in the book of Zechariah matches perfectly the Fibonacci sequence compounded by the number of 10. Notice Psalm 69 verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book 
of the living. Philippians chapter 4 verse 3, whose names are in the book of life. You see, the Bible is declaring all throughout the scriptures that the Bible is a book of life and its comparison with our DNA being literally the book of our life. Some people say, uh, scientists are debating about what is life. life. I think I have a biblical answer to that. Life is anything that has a book. Literally, anything that has DNA is life. This concept we get from the scriptures. Let me show you another place where the word book shows up. Because all through the scriptures, you have the word book, the book, the book. And you see it's the book of life. It's the book of life. It's the book of living. It's the book of the generations. We go back to our illustration of DNA. The two sides of DNA were made of sugar phosphates. Okay, literally phosphates meaning they glow. Okay, and they're made of sugar. And you know what sugar tastes like, don't you? Revelation chapter 10 verse 10. John said, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. That's because the book that God wrote and the book of our DNA are both made exactly the same. Our DNA literally is made out of sugar, sweet as honey. Notice this in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him, that, remember the right hand. I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Notice we have a book in God's right hand. Exodus chapter 32. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, and on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. See, the book that's in God's right hand was prefigured in the Old Testament as Moses bringing down the Ten Commandments from the mountain of God. Remember, we've already seen that in one helical turn of DNA... You have ten stairs or ten rungs in that. That matches perfectly with the Ten Commandments. So watch this. These two tables of stone literally represent the book of life, man's DNA. And by the way, notice Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 13, that these ten commandments were written upon two tables of stone. You know what DNA is? It's a crystal. Literally. It's a stone. You see, the book that God wrote inside of us, our DNA, is written, His law is written in the stones of our DNA. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. God is telling us that we have the law written inside of us. I mean, stop and think about this. Think about how true this is. In just about every corner of the world, there are certain things that are wrong. Murdering someone is wrong. And everybody knows it. Uh, committing adultery, being unfaithful to a spouse, that's wrong. Stealing things is wrong. Lying is wrong. These things are universally wrong. And they reveal to us that God has, in fact, written His law, literally, into our very DNA, which just happens to be made of stone. Remember, we remember what our cells are. Our cells are the stone building blocks that make up the temple of God. Romans chapter 2 verse 15, which show the work of the law, the Ten Commandments, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. God says that the law literally was written in our hearts. Notice Luke chapter 4 verse 4, and Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Notice this verse, Luke chapter 8 verse 11. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Let me stop right here. The word seed, think about this. Whether it's an, an, like a vegetable seed, like a, you know, we have a kernel of seed, that we like popcorn, that we plant in the ground. That seed contains the DNA of that plant. Seed is also a biblical term re that refers to literally the seed of mankind, which contains his DNA. And so this, in this parable in Luke chapter 8, Jesus himself is saying that seed 
is the Bible. That our, he's saying that our DNA is the Bible. Acts chapter 12, verse 24, the Bible says, But the word of God grew and multiplied. Notice that when, when life forms inside the womb, there's one cell. But it doesn't just stay there. And nobody has to make it do this. Nobody has to tell it. This is just the nature of life is that one cell turns into two cells. And those two cells turn into four, then eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. And then on and on and all of a sudden now, remember, in thy book, all my members were written that from the very start, the DNA book has already sequenced out two hands, two arms, two legs, two feet, two eyes, a, no a nose with two nostrils, a mouth, two ears, hair. Everything about that living creature has already been written out in the Word of God, which automatically grows and multiplies because it is the book of life. I mentioned earlier in this that human beings, remember that little fetus inside of a womb and your DNA, they all even follow that Fibonacci sequence that we see even in grass. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 32. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew. As the, notice the speech and the doctrine. Those are words that are related to the Bible. And the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6, the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? He said, all flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof, as is the flower of the field. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Literally, all flesh is just like grass. Why? Because it all has the same Fibonacci spiral, whether it's grass, the clouds, the whirlwind, water, the, the stars of heavens, or your own DNA. They all bear the signature of God that was given to us by way of the Word of God, the Holy Bible. And let's go back to this Remember that remember our grocery sacks. We have 46 packages of of our DNA in every cell in our body. Remember our cells are like the the temple. So we have these 46 packages of our DNA called chromosomes, okay? And these chrom now I want you to notice the appearance of these of these chromosomes and what they look like. We're going to see that in a little bit. When Solomon built the temple, we see this in 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 21. He erected two pillars in the front of this temple. I want you to think of this number two. We have the two, the two sides of DNA. We have the two testaments of the Bible. We have the two lungs, the, the seven spirits of God. He set up the pillars in the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name thereof Boaz. And according to the measurements given to us in the Scripture, both of those pillars are exactly 23 cubits tall. 23 cubits here, 23 cubits here. The chromosomes, the packages where our DNA is stored, are in what's called chromosome pairs. There's 23 pairs of them, or 46, all together. Let me take you another place in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. You see, I believe that God created man, and I believe that God made the woman from the man and brought her unto the man. And when this happened in Genesis chapter 2, I want you to notice exactly what Adam said. Adam said, notice that I have these words underlined. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now, I want to explain what he's talking about here. He's talking about when a man and a woman come together and they join together. Nine months later, they have become one flesh. Because the miracle of conception is, is that 23 chromosomes are taken from the man and 23 chromosomes are taken from the woman. And they're joined together to make a little baby inside the womb of that mother. I count things in the Bible. Did you know that this exact phrase that Adam said has 46 words in it? And it's describing the exact 
conception and the nature of the creation of life inside of a woman's womb. In the 46th book of the Bible, the 46th book of the Bible is where we find out that we are the temple of God. Jesus had told the, had told the people around him, he said, destroy this temple and, and in three days I will rebuild it. And they, they didn't know that he was referring to the temple of his body. And in John chapter 2 verse 20, then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Is it just by accident that there are 46 chromosomes that contain our DNA in every cell in our body and that this number 46 is consistently linked with the temple that, and the tabernacle that we see in the scriptures. So think of this. Here we have the two rungs of DNA, the two sides of DNA. They're joined together by the four base pairs and they're contained in 46 packages called chromosomes. Let me show you this. This Old Testament, we all know, was written in Hebrew, which we've seen earlier has 22 letters. The New Testament, however, was written in Greek. It has 24 letters. When you add the number of letters of the Old Testament, 22, to the number of letters of the New Testament, 24, you have exactly 46. I don't believe that this is by accident. I believe that this, is, this shows us the handiwork of God. Now let's get back to the temple or the tabernacle. I, again, I count things in the scriptures. God told Moses to build the tabernacle exactly the way Moses saw it in heaven. In other words, there was a heavenly temple. We saw that in Revelation chapter 4 with the 24 elders and the throne of God and the seven spirits of God. So what's in heaven has got to match what is in earth. That's what Jesus prayed. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so God wanted Moses to build an earthly tabernacle, a, a temple literally, so that God could dwell inside or with his people. So he built it according to the pattern that God showed him. This is really interesting. Because this tabernacle structure was made out of, it had a tent for a covering, like a ceiling. And it was made of, of, of boards going down the, the, um, the north side, the south side, and on the west side. Now on the front of the tabernacle building, like this, you had four pillars. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. Okay? Down the south side, there were 20 boards. Down the north side, there were 20 boards. And across the back, there were six boards. 46 boards in total, with the entryway consisting of four pillars, which match the four base pairs. I believe that literally, we are the tabernacle of Almighty God. And when Moses constructed, when Moses constructed this tabernacle, he brought in the Levite priests and they were enumerated. And according to Numbers chapter 6 verse 62, there were exactly, exactly 23,000 Levite priests. 23, think of 23 chromosome pairs. 23,000 Levite priests that performed a sacrifice daily. In other words, there was, there was meat. It was either an animal sacrifice or a grain sacrifice. You're going to like this, okay? Because I want to, in fact, I want to go back to this. I want you to see this. This tabernacle is a perfect picture of every cell in your body. The tabernacle itself, the building itself, is the cell nucleus. That's where your DNA is. Remember the 46 boards? The wall around the tabernacle is the cell wall. Now here's what happens. Here's what happens in your cell. This is how you live. We eat things like meat, animals, and we eat things like bread and grains and vegetables and things like that. There were two kinds of sacrifice that you could offer. You could bring in an animal, the flesh, or you could bring in grain. And so the body takes all this stuff that we eat and distributes it to the cells. That is converted, that whatever that is, is converted in the cell to sugar. And sugar is burned up inside the cell to give energy to the cell. People would bring sacrifices to the priest. The priest would take it inside the cell. 
the tabernacle enclosure. They would take it in there, and in there was an altar, and they were burning, whether it was the grain or the meat sacrifices, they were burning these sacrifices, and God said it was a continual daily sacrifice that was taking place. See, we have to eat every day. And it was a continual sacrifice. It matches perfectly with the 23,000 priests. It matches perfectly with God's design of the human cell. So then Romans chapter 12 makes sense to us now. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Which, by the way, the word sacrifice is mentioned exactly in, in 23 verses of the New Testament of the Bible. And so this number 23 and this number 46, they're sort of linked together. It all has to do with sacrifice. Remember, 23,000 priests bringing in the sacrifices so that the people could live because of their sins. There had to be a sacrifice made. The ultimate sacrifice for mankind was Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah just happens to be the 23rd book of the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 53, it enumerates everything that Christ did for us as a sacrifice on the cross with words like, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Notice the Bible is sort of giving you a list of things that happened to Christ. I counted them. There's exactly 46 things that foretold Christ's sufferings on the cross in the 23rd book of the Bible. Now I want to go back to this chromosome. Remember, these 23 pairs or these 46 chromosomes are the packages where our DNA is stored. Now I want you to notice our DNA sort of, it looks this spiral, this Fibonacci sequence, this spiral. But if you look at it really, it sort of looked like, you remember the caduceus? The caduceus was an emblem, an early ancient emblem, I believe, of DNA that had serpents coiled around in a DNA fashion. I want you to notice this because this DNA in these chromosomes matches exactly the cross of Golgotha. We literally have crosses in every cell of our body where our DNA is stored. Remember what we showed, what we illustrated earlier the connection that the Old Testament makes with the New Testament, the fourth book of the Old Testament, the fourth book of the New Testament, they're joined together, they're mated together in the four Gospels. In Numbers, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That is an exact replica of the DNA strands inside of the 46 crosses that are in your cell. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but look at this, but Christ liveth in me. And the reason why we must present our bodies a living sacrifice is described for us in the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 29. I want you to follow with me. Being filled with all, notice we have a list here. Unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. I count things in the Bible. You know, in this section right here, there are exactly 23 things that we have in us. And go back over this list again. Who in here has ever done wickedness? Who in here is, who has ever coveted? Who has ever been malicious? There are things in this list that I know that I have been guilty of and that I still have in me these things. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of of death. You see, these, these things that I have in me 
cause me to be worthy of death. And Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But it doesn't stop there. It says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I want, you to, I want you to get this now. You have in your body right now literally a representation of Christ dying on the cross as a sacrifice for your sins. And Romans 6.23 specifically mentions that he is the, that Christ is the gift of God for your sins. Where did these sins come into play? Genesis chapter 3, we find out that the serpent introduced sin to mankind through Eve. Again, I count things in the Bible. And in Genesis chapter 3, every word that the serpent spoke to Eve totals 46. The number of chromosomes we have in our DNA. Can I tell you what this means? It means something that I think you and I both know. It means that we are all born sinners. And since we're all born sinners, we have it in us. We don't have to learn how to sin, although sometimes we learn how to sin better than what we know how. We don't have to learn how to sin. We have it automatically built into us. And that must be sacrificed. Romans chapter 2, verse 15, which showed the work of the law, remember the Ten Commandments, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. See, you know that you're a sinner. But now, let's get back to Christ on the cross. He died for our sins. Remember the hand that came out of the bosom. Upon Christ was laid upon him all the sins of the world. And what did he do with those sins? He nailed them to his cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The very gift of God says that even though we are born sinners, even though we have this evil nature within us, Christ died to save us from our sins because he took the condemnation of our sins upon himself and nailed it to his cross. And that picture is represented in every cell of our bodies. Christ dying for us. Remember what Paul said? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. And remember, though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me tell you what I find. In the 46th chapter of the New Testament, remember the angels, remember the angels, who in Psalm 19, the stars, the host of heaven, declare the glory of God? In the 46th chapter of the New Testament, we have the angels of God, the, literally the stars. Remember, a star was over Bethlehem announcing something. What were they announcing? Luke chapter 2, verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you is born, think of genetics, this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The angels are declaring the glory of God. And what is the glory of God? The glory of God is that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to bear our sins. And He just happens to show up in the 46th chapter of the New Testament. Romans 6.23 again says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, even though you were born a sinner, and God knows it. God knows you were born a sinner. He didn't just leave you alone to let you die in hell. He has a way of redemption for you. It's the gift of God that if we will confess our sins to God, God will be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. It's all recorded in the book for us. And so while you may have born, been born into sin, God has a new birth waiting for you. Nicodemus was a man who knew the Old Testament and he knew the law very well. And he goes to Jesus and Jesus, he asked Jesus, how can, I, how, can I, how can I go to heaven? Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was asking him, how, how, how can I enter into the womb a second time and be born? Jesus explained it to him and Peter explains it to us in, in, in this beautiful, beautiful fashion. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, remember DNA, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You see, there are two births. And there's an old, old phrase that goes like this, born once you die twice. Because the Bible describes the first death, which is the death of this physical body, and the second death, which is all of those who will not trust God being cast into the lake of fire. The Bible calls that the second death. So the Bible says if you're only born once, you die twice. But if you're born twice, you only die once. This physical body will be shed off, and we are literally born again, created anew, by the incorruptible Word of God. Jesus Christ and the Holy Bible and your DNA and everything that is about you was designed for God and for His pleasure. And what gives Him the most pleasure is when you will come to Christ and say, God, I believe you created me. I believe you fashioned me in your image, and I believe the Word of God is true. And God, I want to be saved. I want to be born again and live in your kingdom forever. I hope if you have not already committed your life to Jesus Christ and believe upon His Word, I hope that you will, and I hope that I'll see you in heaven one day. This is Pastor Mike. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've been educated. I hope... If nothing else, you'll question some of the things that you were taught and to understand that there's more to this universe and more to you than what all the worldly scientists can put together. It's all right here in the Word of God. Believe it, read it, live by it, you will be saved by it. God bless you. Bye-bye.